Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Savvy Seeks. And uh, you'll remember the show that I did most recently uh, was about 1984, and we had people from the field talking about uh, their personal experiences, uh, what they'd actually seen um, in terms of the remnants of uh, 84. You know, even today, I find it very hard to believe that it's 27 years, and we're still, as Sikhs, um, as a world population, uh, we should never see people getting away with murder and violence. Our struggle is to fight for justice. Uh, recently, in my Facebook status, uh, or via Twitter, I had uh, been upset by somebody who said to me, you know, you post a lot of stuff up on uh, uh, the Facebook page that you have on uh, Sikhism. And especially this week, I did put up uh, a few articles uh, about the 84 uh, situation, the pogroms. And, um, and I thought to myself, well, you know, people don't stop talking about genocide. They don't stop talking, the Jews don't stop talking about the Holocaust. Uh, why was I uh, kind of pointed out in that position to say, what well, you're talking a lot about Sikhs? Well, that's because, you know, we haven't got, had the justice. And what I want to explore again on another program, uh, the Savvy Sikhs program is always done in English, and it's there to uh, communicate the wider issues of current affairs. Um, and this is a current affair, uh, the fact that we are, as Sikhs, as a community, uh, as a group of people, uh, a population, an ethnic group that fight for freedom for others, fight for uh, the fact that you know those who are not able to fight for themselves to de defenseless. And yet right now we're also fighting for our own uh, freedom to communicate the justice that we really want. Uh, it's not about reconciliation, it's not about closure, it's clearly about the fact that people today are still suffering from that, whether it be mentally or whether it be from a position of uh, the fact that they're in poverty. Justice is probably the most important thing. But justice also is combined with this other word, which is hope, uh, the hope that there will be a better tomorrow, a better understanding for people. So I'm very honored to have again with me uh, today. Uh, we had him recently, and we're uh, very privileged to have um, Harinder Singh come over from the US. Uh, he is uh, one of the founders of uh, SICRI, a major institution in my view doing wonderful stuff for Sikhism. Uh, SICRI stands for the Sikh Research Institute based in San Antonio. Uh, I strongly recommend you visit their website, sikri.org. Uh, you can check out a lot of the videos and webinars that are done uh, on talking about education, uh, consistency of education, and also communicating the current issues that are out there today. Also, we have with um, the uh, workshops that are there, the SOGI uh, curriculum. Again, we're talking about consistency across all the Gurdwaras in Canada and the US. And uh, Harinder Singh has done some major work in that area. But today, let's concentrate on 84. Uh, Harinder is over here to do a series of seminars uh, at um, Guy's and St. Thomas's. I think uh, he's going to be at King's College campus. Uh, uh, he's also doing some workshops in Southall uh, on Saturday. Uh, so this program is going out. And hopefully, you'll be able to attend those. Or we'll ask him about those. But let's concentrate on 84. My issue and my question again and again is why is there a situation where um, it's almost like slow? It's almost like there's only a few individuals that are out there fighting the cases, and especially the people that have been named and people who've witnessed those individuals actually causing those crimes or facilitating or you know, making sure that those people that were Sikhs were singled out and killed uh, with petrol on them, with tires on, their, on top of their necks. Uh, or the women uh, who were Sikhs were being raped in front of their actual children as well. To me, that is a genocide. Why is it so slow? So, Harinda, welcome again to the show. It was a rather long intro that we had but to set the scene. Uh, and the scene uh, is still of devastation uh, mm -hmm. in your mind, especially to the people that actually were there. And I know people who were there in 84. Uh, I know other people that went to the camps that were set up uh, within days. Why is the process so slow in your view? Sure, Guru Fataji. I think a couple of things we need to keep in mind is uh, that we can have conjecturing on the process and even what you mentioned when people are asking us, why do you even remember this 27 years later? Well, I, I think I'll quote Mr. Fulka here because he's a person on the ground who is fighting the cases for the last 26 years on his own. And three, four days ago, I was talking to him and he mentioned, well, one of the reasons things are slow is it's intentionally slow. If witnesses are dying, if there are people 
uh, Judiciary and CBI, which stands for Central Bureau of Investigation of India, is delaying its reports. If the cases are not being on docket, essentially, witnesses will fall off. Some are being bought off, some are being coerced, some are dying. And when that happens, you are basically not dealing with the issue itself. So one of the reasons it's slow is it's intentional. Second is you're dealing with a large bureaucracy in India, uh, which when you are fighting a state and its machinery at anywhere in the world, it, it could be very much in US or here, when you have a large machinery you're fighting, you need many more people on the ground. We actually in the Sikh Army, among six, you know, we claim to have 27 million diaspora. Mm -hmm. We don't have too many worker bees. You know, I put it to second generation these days that, you know, the revolution is not gonna be Twittered. You need people on the field doing things, then you need people who are Twittering and writing about it on the Facebook. In our case, we, won't, we don't have too many foot soldiers in Gurdanak's revolution. Mm -hmm. So that's the other reason it's getting delayed. It so there's not a of that. Uh, I don't know if you know, there's a very famous, unfortunately died recently, uh, Gil Scott Heron. Yes. Uh, he's an incredible rapper as well as, uh, you know, uh, roots uh, musician in yeah. terms of in the US. And uh, one of his famous tracks is uh, the revolution will not be televised. Exactly, you know? exactly. So, you know, essentially uh, one is a state issue that is an intentional delay. Second is I think resourcefulness, people resourcefulness. I want to focus on that. It's not the money thing. I refuse to believe Sikh community is a very giving community. Mm. We, we have enough financial capital among Sikhs. And professionals. Exactly, so yeah. what we are missing is, the reason it's getting delayed is, not enough concerted effort from a people's angle, whether it's as a movement, whether it is a, a legal battle, whether it is constructing uh, a social movement, networking and alliance within the Indian confines and outside India. Uh, we, we can't just be talking about among Sikhs, that's one part of the puzzle. We need to talk at several different, in several different dimensions uh, to, to assure that these kind of efforts are leveraged to deliver something. Right now, we don't have very many deliverables. So I guess uh, in one perspective, it's like you've got a, a social level of networking, which is you bring the issue out to the fore. Uh -huh. And another level is more the physical networking, where you network within the institutions uh, that are there, whether they are in India or outside India, yes. whether they have empathy you yeah. think rather than sympathy? Well, you know, uh, <laughs> in the, in the non-profit world, you know, they talk about there are three things you need. Uh, there's the human capital, there's financial capital, and social capital. So I'm going to focus on the social capital here. Social capital actually has three ingredients to it. Number one is trustworthiness. So people who are trying to do these things, do they have enough trustworthiness? I would say there's a big issue within the community on that. Second thing is, are they building institutions to take care of this? I think pretty much we know the answer there. Mm. I mean, as I mentioned, Mr. Fulka tries to do it on his own. The only other institution I know who's effectively been, consistently been doing this is an soft organization outside of, uh, from, uh, from US, but working with lawyers in India. So institution building hasn't occurred to take care of this. You in your introduction mentioned, and six love to talk about parallels with the Jewish community. They build institutions. They have an organization called Searchlight, which still hunts down Nazi officers mm. as recent as three months ago they Absolutely. did that. Yeah. So you know- It doesn't matter whether they're 90 years old, they're Exactly, get, you know, the officer, he was hiding in US somewhere. Yeah. So now the point mm. is, they build institutions to do it. So trustworthiness is number one thing. Number two thing is, are they building institutions to do this? And third is networking and alliances with other people of similar issues. I think at, bo at all three levels, our work is cut out. We really need to be working uh, diligently to get all three things done. That's what creates a real social capital. And okay. I would say we are missing that. I, I, th I think you're about, in terms of the, what I would call, it's a new phrase I just thought of, by the way, uh -huh. the kind of good faith organizations, yeah. you know, doing things in good faith because they believe in it or the fact that they have a social conscience that they want to do something about it. Mm -hmm. uh, this week on the first, in terms of the, what I would call, it, it's a new phrase I just thought of, by the way, uh -huh. the kind of good faith organizations, yeah. you know, doing things in good faith because they believe in it or the fact that they have a social conscience that they want to do something about it. Mm -hmm. uh, this week on the phone, I was just so amazed that I managed to talk to her, actually, because I only mentioned her on a program recently, and, uh, and then uh, one of the producers here said to me, well, I've got her phone number. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Simran Jit Kaur, mm -hmm. and uh, she wrote a book called Saffron Salvation. That's right. Uh, it's an incredible book. I actually spoke to her on the phone two days ago, uh, and she's actually over here, and we're hoping to get her to uh, as, as part yeah. of an interview to talk to her. Now she does uh, work in uh, Punjab and she, she has an organization which is trying to yeah. look after the Shaheeds of that time uh, yeah. who are still suffering. Uh, and you have a Sikh coalition, you have United Sikhs, you yeah. have a lot of these what I call good faith. And I don't mean in a bad yeah. way, I mean in a good way. You've got Sikh aid, you've got CASA aid. These are good faith because 
they're not doing it because we've got good faith. They're doing it in the fact that they are physically on the ground yeah. and they're trying to help people. Well, right? you know, I, I, I mean, some of them, are, you know, it's difficult to get money because they've got to do charity work and people do loads of work in charity. All that is funds, all you know? that is true. What I was trying to say was that there needs to be focus in these things. I didn't say individuals and organizations are not doing it. You know, you again, you know, I'm going to cite because you cited a Jewish parallel. Mm. Let's just think about this. Forget even trying to do things on the ground. You know, you go anywhere in the world. I was in Cape Town. Even there in that touristy town, right. they have a Holocaust museum. Mm. We have not even built our memorials. Yeah. We don't even have our narratives down. Forget about trying to tell the world and trying to get convictions and trying to take them to international levels and even doing proper rehabilitation. I'll tell you, what Sadar Patwan saying, Mr. Fulka, myself, we spent two years trying to set up a good rehabilitation program mm. in Delhi for the survivors of November 84. Guess what? It didn't happen. We couldn't even find the right managers and the right funding and the right psychologists to work on it. So yes, there are individual efforts. I've been part of several of them as well. But as a community, we have not delivered because we have not invested in social capital. I'm going to come back to it. We can keep doing individual efforts. And yes, they do help. Yes, they do make certain impact. But the level of impact we are expecting as a community will not happen unless we really truly build social capitals. Yeah, and, and I think the other point you made about the networking part of it as well. I mean, I think also taking it to the right level. Yes. The fact, the fact that it's seen as a serious issue. I do really like your idea, and actually I mentioned it on a recent blog that I was working on, which was the fact that we should have a museum yeah. um, to commemorate the lives. But yeah. also, uh, it's interesting, when you go to uh, Anne Frank's museum yes. in Amsterdam, yes. I don't know if they still got it, they might have it, but if you go to the basement, there is actually a recording of Le Pen, yeah. who was the National Front leader, the, the extremist right leader in yeah. France. And the, the, uh, they, they show a, a play, a recording of uh, one of um, his Le Pen's uh, yeah. speeches, bringing out the fact that, hey, this is so extreme that fascism yeah. should raise its head again, yeah. uh, especially acro across the whole of Europe. Mm. Because we don't, you know, as humans, we don't learn from our past. You know? well, you, you'll have a, you know, a pogrom. Yeah. Uh, you'll have all these six million people die, the Jews die. You have a pogrom in 1984. And then you have 2002, the Gujarat situation. Well, you know, it's Someone very clear. Over 3,000. I mean, maybe the figure is even bigger. I think the figure, figure is bigger. All the people that died in 1984 were Sikhs. Yeah. In the 2002 Gujarat yeah. uh, situation, there was a mix of Hindus and Sikhs and uh, Muslims that died. You know? Well, you, it's interesting uh, correlation you're bringing up. And you know, this is where I think every Indian should be concerned about this. It's just not a Sikh issue. One out of seven person in this world is an Indian. And if they're really interested in keeping the Indianness together, or India as actually the largest democracy as they claim to be, you know, if they would have dealt with 1984 November programs properly, uh, Bombay wouldn't have happened in 95. Gujarat in 2002 wouldn't have happened. What you're seeing, the trend in all of them is there is a majority party as well as majority community whose behalf the party orchestrates these things, goes out and targets particular minorities. Mm. Then they prepone the elections and they get overwhelming majority and they are voted back in office. This is what was happening in 40s Europe. The last 100 years ago, Europe went through this. You will not see this today in Europe. Mm. Well, you're seeing this in India now. So if Indians are really concerned about creating a true social fabric in Indian community. It's not just a Sikh issue or a Hindu issue or a Muslim issue. Every Indian should be worked up as to what the hell is happening in my country. Well, in a certain extent, there have been recently, and we digressed just slightly about the fact that there were people talking about corruption and you know, people in a hunger strike and all kinds of things were going on. There seemed to be this kind of, you know, we can't stand for this corruption. We need to get over it. And I think there's that famous book, isn't there, called uh, White Tiger, where the guy uh, who wrote the book in, in Diga. Yeah, he says, um, I've got two votes. One vote, which um, yeah. is my, my vote in Bangalore or wherever, yeah. and my other vote, which is my legal vote. So the system is so corrupt in terms of yeah. you can't even believe the numbers. But you know, yeah. the devil is always in the detail. Arvind Diga's basic thesis is, and I love the book, that's why, and maybe that's why India and Indians didn't like it as much. Mm -hmm. His basic thesis is you can understand India if you understand one relationship, which is the history of India, and even it continues today is a history or relationship between slaves and masters. Mm. He says, if you understand master and slave relationship, you will even understand Indian marriage. I mean, he goes to that far. You will understand a relationship between the driver and its owner, a relationship between uh, a larger politician, a smaller politician. He says, the whole thing 
is set up on the system of master and slave. But the devil is always in the detail. You know, you mentioned this anti-corruption drive in India and how certain youngsters and people came on the streets and tweeted about it and became a social movement. Devil is in the detail. We should definitely read what Arundhati Roy wrote about it. We should also look at who funded this corruption movement and how this was used as a, a BJP spend it and made it part of their movement and funded it. And Ford Foundation in America is sitting there and funding this. Point is, yes, this is true. These movements are taking place. But just like in 1984 issues, devil is in the detail. Elections were pre pawned People were given voter lists to go target six. And a majority community then voted the same party into power by one of the largest uh, margins. So what this is doing is you are authenticating. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially, you know how in South Africa you had a legalization of apartheid? Uh, and how in a Nazi Germany, you got the majority community to vote for the party which believed in elimination of a particular race. Mm. Similar things are happening, and these are very, very, very dangerous trends from both world phenomena, Indian phenomena, and definitely a sick phenomena. How much do you think that uh, people that live in India uh, actually realize the importance of it in terms of the fact that, yeah, this is, I mean, I, I, I think it's, um, it's interesting that it's, uh, there are kind of so many things that happened in the last week of November, isn't there? there there's, you know, ironically, there's the, the horror of uh, the celebration of horror through Halloween, which yeah. is pretty weird. Uh, and then you've got the, the, um, the, the, the 1984 situation for three days. That, uh, and then, then you've got Remembrance Week because people remember the World, World War soldiers. I think they've got Remembrance Sunday yeah. coming up. Um, and interestingly, I don't know if you've been following the situation, the St. Paul's situation, where you have uh, these people are camped outside. St. Paul's, and they also in where you, uh, you're from the U.S. Occupy Wall Street. Uh, Occupy Wall Street. Well, kind of let's contextualize anti, all anti, this. Anti-capitalist thing that's going on. Is there a, is there a groundswell movement that is, it's just seen, well, there's, there's a couple of things that people mentioned. First of all, should the church get closer to the, to the people that are well, actually saying there needs to be more for people? You know, it's less, yeah. let's be less greedy. Is all of this driven on greed? fundamentally, yeah. and that's why we can never get away from it, because that is a fundamental evil that drives a large part of the world. Yeah. You know? Well, let's, let's deal with uh, one, one point at a time. Yeah, yeah, so sure. For example, you know, Halloween, yeah. I mean, I was writing something about it the other day as well. I said, yeah, you know, Halloween is where the witches are infesting the darkness. In case of six, mm. you know, in the same day, what happens, is it's not the ghosts or the goblins who did this, it's the human beasts who did this. Absolutely. So there are, there are very different things. Yeah. One is may be imaginative, but the other one is very real and it's humans doing it. Mm -mm. Now, you know, yesterday I saw, sitting in this, uh, uh, in the, the, I'm in London right now, so I was looking at what's happening here. You have an archbishop who's making a strong statement about what needs to happen. He's a religious leader of the mm -hmm. country and mm -hmm. he's giving a political statement about where the church needs to be on this occupying, you know, they had occupied the, uh, the cathedral here, St. Paul's, I think it is. Now, let's go, and, and I want to superimpose this in 1984 in India. You know, there's only one leader at national, international level who is, I would say, a symbolic of, you know, what India did and what Sikhs were going through. Pope John Paul II is on record denouncing that, that this is a distorted act. Where were all the other leaders? Even the Sikh or Jathedar and Head Granthi, for example, at that time, I think the Head Granthi he was, in June 84, he says there was a gun pointed in his head, so he gave a wrong statement saying, you know, Akal Takht is okay. Religious clergy of India, whether it's the Shankarachars, whether it is the RSS's mouthpiece of organizer newspaper, whether it is the Christian leaders, even celebrated American New York-based writers like Amitav Ghosh, he writes in New Yorker magazine saying, it took people like me, who were supposedly the leftist intellectual of India, more than 10 years to even talk about an issue. Mm. So, you know, what I'm saying is there's a conspiracy of silence around, around 1984, and that's a phrase Mr. Patwan Singh used to use. And I agree with that. The conspiracy of silence exists because uh, there was a large section of the community who just watched or participated in the mayhem in the capital city on the orders of the ruling party, on the orders of Delhi administration and police and army, on the orders of where the Speaker of Indian Parliament, can you imagine this comes on and says, you know, to maintain the integrity of India, if we have to eliminate 20 million six, we will do so. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have that level of state propaganda, where the state TV is saying blood for blood, 
the, the only conclusion we can reach is that the major and there is a JNU professor, Satish Jain, saying this. He says, you know, when the majority community votes somebody into power after a genocidal event, it just shows you they had a buy-in of a larger community. This is what we need to focus on. The human behavior, and you know, the mob mentality is very easy to create. Is the power too great for us to continue to challenge it? You know, well, in, from a sick ideological I mean, and a I, sick I, spirit I, angle. I don't mean as a negative. I mean no, no, no. I know what you're asking, but yeah. you know, from a sick spirit, no power is a great power, Absolutely. and from a human spirit, yeah. and that's what it shows in this Arab Spring as well, yeah. and and what eventually defeated what Tom Brokaw uh, wrote a book, and eventually he coined the phrase called the greatest generation of this uh, he has lived through was World War II. Mm. I mean. America, and I'm coming from American angle, I know it's got its own imperialism these days, but back in World War II, they were what, 18th largest army? Mm -hmm. And they were dealing with the superpowers of the world? Guess what, eventually, we need to be thanking Russia from that angle, you know, how they help. So we have to understand how things get done. The human spirit which is needed, the resources which are needed, no power can uh, occupy the human mind. And yeah. we know this from the survivors of the Holocaust, and we know this from the survivors of 1984 genocidal campaigns of six, which started in June 84, and they continued till November and more. Uh, and we need to be very, very careful not to present them as singular events, uh, as the November 84 of Delhi and Kanpur and the rest of India, or June 84 of just the war subcomplex. There are several so-called operations by the governments which were targeting six and their places of worship and learning and their leaders, and they eliminated us uh, in, in, a, in a, 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 what uh, Joyce Pettigrew called, this was an attack on Sikh culture and Sikh nation and Sikh psyche. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it, it look, you know, the term orchestrated, you know, mm -hmm. orchestra, orchestrated. Yes. You know, they, they, were, they were in, um, there was an alliance. Yes. And it's almost that, that you know, you, you mentioned, I, I, it's quite interesting you said about the, the silence, you know. Mm -hmm. um, the silence also exists in Tiananmen Square. That's right. Yeah. And uh, you've got a power there, which is China, you know, um, in a very famous film uh, called um, Seven Days in Tibet. Yes. Uh, Brad Pitt, I don't know if you, you've seen yeah, it. Yeah, yes, I have. Yeah, and there's a very famous scene in the film yeah. where the Chinese fly in with the, w with the plane, they come in, they do a, a three-point turn, they put yeah. a whole load of blast, they walk in yeah. to where the Dalai Lama's sitting. Yeah. The Dalai Lama says, well, we want to, you know, have peace and we want to work out what your problem is. Yeah, and then he, he, the, the, the Chinese guy stands up and says, religion is a disease, you know. And because they, their fundamental belief is that you, they don't believe in religion, right? Mm. And they walk away from it. Yet today we see, again, it's a, it's a similar pattern. It was about the same time. A lot of kids were killed on yeah. the streets, you know. Um, this wall, maybe we should use it, uh, this wall of silence. What do we do? What do we do to support, say, uh, you know, Mr. Fulka, some of the other yeah. organizations? What do we do? Do we need to have new champions uh, that are there? Do we need to... Where, where does the strategy come from? Sure. I mean, I can uh, uh, talk from idea level, and then you have to really come back to the trustworthiness and uh, institution building and creating the right networking. Alliances with people who actually work on these issues. For example, in 84, there are Justice Sikri put out a report, former Chief Justice of India, not a sick guy, as to what really happened. Two professors, uh, uh, Gobinde Mukta and Rajni Kothari, put out a book called Who Are the Guilty, where they actually named the organizations and the sitting MPs who orchestrated this. We had several, several other op uh, books came, Punjab Under Siege and Analysis came out. This stuff came out between 84 and 85. And even uh, Mr. Fulka's got a book out as Mr. Well. Fulka's book came out recently, yeah, but the point is that within, yeah. within a year, there was enough evidence by non sikh sources as to what has happened. We did not build alliances with them. We did not build alliances with people's movement in India. But who should do that? Should there be existing Well, it's you and me. I'm going to come yeah. back to you and me. You okay. know, when we rely on superstructures to develop these things, mm. if they already have an agenda to delay everything, why would they do this? Right. And that includes our own religious and political leaders. Mm. You know, they don't talk about any of these issues, the six uh, Sikh so-called religious, spiritual, and political leaders. They only talk about these issues when this month comes and they just play with their psyche and emotions and they move on. Mm. Or they talk about these issues when there's so an SGPC they election or Shumar Akali election. Well, they let them talk about it for a few days. You know, it's Remembrance Week. Well, we'll give it a term yeah. and then they'll forget about I, it for I think year. We, I think uh, we should not allow our intelligence to be insulted so easily. You know, we are, sick belief is we are a product of divine gift. And within that divinity comes, uh, especially from Gurbani's ankle, that the Vaheguru we believe in, the one force we believe in, 
believes in complete justice, pura nyao kare kartar. And if we believe in complete justice, we have to be the agents of those justice. So some of us need to become better documenters. Some of us need to become, you know, if you champion human rights, some of us need to become lawyers, some of us need to become, figure out how to create these proper social networks. Mm -hmm. And also some of us need to work on rehabilitating and creating sort of this, uh, a movement. I'm going to come back to a campaign or a movement. You know, Save Darfur campaign, the whole world knows mm -hmm. because it was a campaign run by very few people. We need to really put our minds together we, as a community, as an individual. So what can we really do? Well, there are only two things to be done. In every scenario, there are only two kinds of help. It's a physical help, uh, your mind or your time you're giving, or it's a monetary help. If you cannot give time, give money to those who really do it. Check their record. Mm. I, mean, we, I mean, this is not anyone who walks in, I walk up to you and say, you know, I'm doing this. Yeah, so are 50 other people. We need to have metrics for these is what is your deliverable you know what kind of impact has this generated and are these the right people who are qualified ones to do this what is their training you know those kind of questions need to be asked rather than somebody in a good faith just doing it as you said earlier and the second thing we can do is use our own systems you know start your own tape recorder start oral histories you know go to the survivors record them you know i went to uh, recently, you know, where the Lady Liberty is standing uh, in New York City, right next to it is an immigration museum. I walked there in there. Right. There are oral a testimonies Alice of Island, isn't it? yeah, Staten Island. Oh, Staten and uh, sorry, Alice Island. You're yeah. right. And then they came there and they're recording why they landed in America. Mm -hmm. how, why they're, they're one of the major reasons they uh, were mentioning is a religious freedom and political freedom. Mm -hmm. You know, in diaspora, we have six million six now, outside of Punjab. Well, their stories of post-84 needs to be captured, why they landed in America, in Germany, in Italy, in U.S., in Canada, in other places, Australia. And those become our narratives. So I would say, if nothing else, at least work to understand the sick narrative of these things. And please do not further the propaganda of the government and its agencies, which is not my verbiage. This is not a sick rhetoric. Mr. Fulka, who is a standing counsel for Indian government who represents these cases, has the same idea. He's saying, you know, we need to present within, I mean, he has to, I mean, he's fighting the cases, so he has to maintain the legal uh, framework within the Indian Constitution. But those of us who don't have to, we need to record our narratives. What happened, just like our narrative of the 1760s is when there is a, what we call, great holocaust of six. Or what does look at? We record our narratives, as Ganda Singh has recorded. Uh, the 84 onwards narratives need to be recorded, which you and I need to be doing right now. Yeah, I and mean, I think uh, it's, it's interesting because it brings about the fact that you can record stuff, you know, with, with iPads and iPhones and, you know, whatever you can get your hands on, you know, yes. MP3 players. Um, but, and I think when we've discussed this before, I think when in our, even in our last uh, time when we met, was the fact that does the, me does the media at the end of the day, uh, do we need to own, right? And do we need a media that's more comprehensive? I say that because if you look at Al Jazeera English, you know, it, it's a channel which hired a lot of uh, journalists from the uh, traditional media. Yes. Uh, and they've come in and they've, they've got a very good, uh, well-respected channel. I think it's Al Jazeera uh, uh, children now as well. There's the Al Jazeera in their own Arab language. The fact is they've become a lot more uh, kind of wider appeal yes. um, in terms of people tuning in for the news. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yeah. come back to what I uh, said mm -hmm. earlier and the uh, same thing. You know, we are expecting larger wins without having some sort of organic development of these things. Mm. You know, we, are, we had our first newspaper, Six did, Punjab did in 18, 1886. We lost that somewhere. You know, people think Tribune is our paper, but it's not. We need to invest in, again, come, I'm, I'm going to bring it to the, Al Jazeera is a good example in terms of their impact, but you know, we need to also look at the struggles they are facing and who funds it and how it really happened. Mm. We have not really built corpus funds for these things. Sure. So it comes down to smaller efforts. And you know, when people say, I'm going to bring in another rhetoric which happens, uh, comes on in Sikh community, we don't have enough unity, that's why nothing is getting done. Well, there never is a unity in a true sense. You know, how many people really sided with the gurus even when Guru Hargobind Sahib was being sent to jail by Azhangir? The unity is. A bit of escapism and a cop out now. Union's been we need to people who well. get united are the ones who work, mm. and this is what Gurmani says the same thing that turde ko mile muwe ko muwa. Dead people find dead people, and the activists find activists. We just need to reduce a little bit of a rhetoric and get busy. Those who work, they will develop unifications to get things done. And this is the history in the world. This is the history of the six. 
people work together, they unify when things are happening. We don't unify by doing lectures and sending hukum namas from Akal Takht only. Do you think that uh, apathy, and that doesn't necessarily apply to uh, one particular community, but ap apathy is a result of survivalism, that people are so busy in times of, of austerity to want to survive, to want to look after their families and kids uh, and, yeah. you know, look after the responsibilities that they have to earn money, to live a day-to-day -day life, that almost this other thing gets put on the wayside. Because you mentioned there's only a few people today that are really pushing this, um, that talking about it on Facebook or they're not talking about it or bringing great awareness. But the people that who, who are challenging those institutions, there's only a few of them. Um, is that because, you know, they've been doing it for so long, which is great, but it's difficult for other people to do it because they're so busy, wrapped up in their own lives to well, survive. I, I, know, I mean, I know, you know, you I mean, a, this you argument can be made about anything in life. You know, there's always an opportunity cost. This is why every Sikh at least needs to answer to himself or herself, are they really operating as a Sikh or are they just fighting about the labels? And that's why in the community now, most discussions or fights are about who's a Sikh. Mm -hmm. I'm least interested in that. You know, when government or its machinery came to kill Sikhs, they did not ask you how many barnies you read or whether you ate meat or not or whether you even wore kirpan. Some of the postmortem reports show that just by uh, looking at the kada, they identified this guy was a sick and they burned him. Mm. Point is, the one who comes to kill you knows exactly who you are. You know, and in this kind of... Well, uh, a lot of them had electoral lists, so they knew where they lived as well. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm bringing it internally to answer your question now, mm. that we are not focused. Every sick needs to answer in standing in front of their guru Am I operating as a Sikh? Am I developing my internal mechanisms and strength through Bani and part and the religious spiritual activism to really become politically active? And we really have to do this. Uh, we know there are 27 million Sikhs worldwide. Not everyone can do it. But you know they all need to have in their psyche that if I cannot do it, I must at least support it. Now Sikhi is becoming something else, and I think this is a major problem. You know, nobody talks about Guru Nanak's activism and the Guru's activism in... We, Diwali just came, right? How many of us are really focused on... If I translate even the most popular phrase about Guru Hargobind Sahib, him coming to Delhi during that time, uh, to, uh, to Amritsar on a, on a Diwali day, we call him Data Baddi Chhod. That's what was written in Urdu in Gawadir Kela. As a kid, I used to go visit that place. That even that uh, writing is not there anymore. What are we replacing that with? In English, that means the emancipator, the guy who brought freedom. In, in our case, it's guru. Are we really, what freedoms are we establishing when we are, well, uh, are many other playing are those, uh, you know, eating our sweets and, uh, yes. and, yeah. uh, and, and, the, and the atishbaji, the firecrackers are going on. Similarly, Pai Mani Singh mar was martyred that day I was gonna for say the that. reason it was right to assemble freely. Mm. Our history, I would say, is becoming mythology. Sikhs are more busy doing other things. We are trying to act like other religious communities. You know what the yogis earlier did, the Qazis, the Islamic laws, the Brahmans, the Hindu spiritualists, the yogis, the ascetics. We are becoming more and more like that. Right. We are not looking at the ideas as a third alternative, as a new lifestyle presented in Guru Granth Sahib by the gurus who trained us for almost 250 years in the, in the land of five rivers in Punjab. And that training produced incredible activism in Sikh psyche, which is why your forefathers and foremothers and my forefathers and foremothers decided to become Sikhs. Today, we are trying to make people sick by telling them what to eat and how to pray. This was never a Sikh prerogative. We became Sikhs. Our generations in South Asia became Sikhs, our uh, ascendants. They became Sikhs because of the values which were given by Sikhi. Those values refused to accept slavery of any kind whether it was economic slavery, whether it was political slavery, or whether it was spiritual slavery. And we need to go back towards that. We need to become free individuals, free thinkers and free doers, have a direct relationship with the divine. And the power of that direct relationship is we are able to develop real good responses rather than the half-baked ones, which I'm trying to present right the now. the quality of what we do will shine through as Sikhs? You know, Professor Puran Singh is one of my favorite poets. And in his uh, book, Spirit Born People, there is one essay on arts on, uh, notes on art and personality. And he starts that essay with first life, then its expression. Today I would submit uh, most of us are too focused on how to express what Sikhi is, 
but we don't have the life of Sikhi within us. Right. Okay. Well, I mean, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for coming. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing on the weekend. Uh, you, you've got some things Sure. Uh, I mean, this week there are a series of events going on. I think some of them, uh, by the time this program airs, will be gone. But uh, there's a talk about November 84 at King's College and then at Royal Asiatic Society. I'm presenting the larger thesis of why six fight. Uh, we're doing workshops at Norwood Hall for college and high school students from 10 to 4 on understanding the guru as an institution in Sikhi. That's on Saturday, I think. That's on Saturday uh, coming up. And uh, on Saturday evening, we're actually doing a talk at uh, Park Avenue Gurdwara in South Hall on what is Gurdwara, how it was envisioned in Gurbani, and historically what Gurdwaras did, and what Gurdwaras need to do today. So th those are the kind of events going on uh, this week uh, in London area. And then on Sunday, I'm number at the bottom of the screen. To sure, the I think uh, if you want more information to your audience, you can visit our website, sikri.org. This is sikri.org slash events, and you'll see all the details. There's a talk at, uh, at the Leicester Gurdwara on what has happened, what brought about 1984 from 47 to 84 thesis. But you know, coming back to our, uh, if I may speak sure, to your I'm audience kidding. about it, you know, number one enemy of human rights, because these are primarily human rights violation, is silence. Your silence in your homes, not having this conversation with your kids, your silence in the community, your silence in the larger community outside the six, that's what's not allowing this to uh, obtain justice. Silence is the number one enemy of the human rights world. And, and uh, in, in the case of six, you and I, if we are not fighting this conspiracy of silence, then we are basically saying, let injustice continue. So it's up to you and me. Uh, I would say don't be silent about this issue anymore. Uh, absolutely. And, uh I would like to say thanks very much to Harid Singh for coming over. So good to see you again. Um, Same here. Uh, coming over from US and uh, spending time with us and as part of his uh, uh, global uh, talks that he does. Uh, there's a lot of effort, a lot of energy, a lot of time away from his family. Uh, it's a great server and uh, we are very honored to have him on the channel and uh, especially on uh, the show today. So that's it for this week. Um, I think the, the closing words are, um, you know, there's no more I can say really on, on that. There is a wall of silence. There is the importance of taking the initiative. Uh, and also, find out about those organizations. Do research on them. Uh, learn more. Go to places like Casa Aid and uh, Seek Aid and you know, some of the uh, places that are you know, Simranjit Kaur's uh, charity. Um, Sikri, great organization, doing a lot of good things for uh, Sikhism. Find out, seek. Uh, who are the best people to help you and support you so that when you are out there and you're talking to people, you talk from a point of accuracy, informed decision, clear reference, and uh, reliable sources. Uh, because the information is in front of you, and only you can make that change in terms of uh, to break down that wall of silence uh, to ensure that the justice comes home, comes home to your own uh, psyche, but comes home to the population, whether they be Sikh or non-Sikh. Um, a holocaust is a holocaust in any culture, and those people who have instigated it need to be brought to justice. And as a human race, we need to realize that it is unacceptable to do bad things to each other. Why would you go?